Good evening and welcome. My name is Maria Oswiki, Principal at the Secondary Campus. Thank you all for joining us online today. The purpose of this Zoom meeting is to share with you what arrangements will be in place for Year 11 and Year 13 following the Easter break, and what we currently know about how grades will be awarded in GCSE, IGCSE, AS and A-level courses. With me today are members of the secondary leadership team, our higher education team, and our pastoral leadership team, along with our head of school, Mr. Schultz. It has been an unsettling time for all of our students, but particularly so for our year 11 and our year 13 students, who have been working so hard to progress in their examination courses and work towards their goals only to find that the goalposts have shifted. As late as Christmas, we were assured that examinations would take place and would play their normal role in determining final grades across GCSE, IGCSE and A-level subjects. We now know that with the exception of Cambridge exam board subjects, this is not the case. I stand in absolute admiration of how our students have responded to this turn of events, how they continue to show up mentally, emotionally, and physically, how they have stepped up to their mock examinations, and how they have motivated themselves and each other. Whilst the situation is far from ideal, and whilst there are details of the process that exam boards have yet to confirm, please rest assured that we are in a strong position as a school. We have an excellent A-level and GCSE track record, a good external moderation record, a rich body of valid internal assessment data, strong mock results derived from a rigorous process good course completion, and most importantly, well-taught, hard-working students. We are doing all we can to support our students, and we know that you are too. We will begin this evening by addressing the question areas that you have already raised through the G form, and to clarify the steps we have taken and continue to take to support our students at this time. After we have responded to those question areas that you have already raised, and should you find that you have further questions that you wish to ask about year 11 and year 13 grading and the timeline asked for Easter that we haven't already covered in the main presentation, we will then invite you to ask those questions through the chat function. And we will seek to answer as many as possible today before we close the meeting at half past five. On a housekeeping front, please note that if you wish to ask a question, please do, do so through that chat function and direct all questions to me, Maria Ozawiki. I would recommend that you hold back on asking the questions whilst the main presentation is, is going because you may find that your question will be answered at some point. If at the end you have not had a chance to ask your question or to have it responded to, please do not hesitate to email the relevant member of the team and I will speak with you at the end about communication and contact details for them. So I will now hand over to Mr. Dave Potts, who is our Vice Principal for Learning and Progression. And Dave will speak to you about how teachers will be generating teacher assessed grades across non-Cambridge subjects and how students will be prepared and supported for final internal assessments after Easter. Dave. Thanks, Maria. Good evening, everyone. As you know, this year, students' grades will be decided by teachers using a broad range of assessment evidence, with the exception of Cambridge courses, which will still be determined by public examinations. Although it may appear to be a similar situation to last year, there are many key differences. Last year, we used predictive models to submit grades that students were statistically most likely to receive based on the progress they would have normally made over the time between their internal assessments and their final summer exams, according to previous cohorts. In other words, we were able to forecast a grade in each case. 
This year, we're not permitted to use a predictive method and must only submit grades based on evidence of what students have achieved in internal assessments to produce a grade that reflects their current level of attainment. To ensure students are given the opportunity to attain well, a great deal more preparatory work was done by teachers and students for the delayed February mock examinations than is normally the case. This has resulted in a set of grades that are better than we might have ordinarily expected at this stage in the course, so our students are now in a favourable position in this respect. Furthermore, we'll be conducting a further set of internal assessments after the term two break to ensure we capture students' attainment in order to factor in the skills development and consolidation of learning that take place in these latter stages. We're looking here to give students a final opportunity to be assessed at a time which aligns with the exam period to complete our evidence base. The exact nature of the evidence we can draw from and how we go about grade generation will be subject to much more stringent quality assurance than last year, as exam boards and regulators will stipulate the means by which schools go about the process. We're awaiting further guidance on what these quality assurance measures will be, but we're expecting to be held accountable through evidence sampling of internal assessment papers and grade records to ensure our compliance. Exam boards will change our grades if they deem our submissions to be too generous in relation to the evidence we provide. When generating teacher assessed grades, we'll draw from core assessments, mock exams, coursework and the final assessments in as positive a manner as possible to ensure students receive grades in line with their demonstrated ability and with typical grade distributions of Alice Smith students in previous years. We're in a stronger position to do so than many schools in the British system, having been able to conduct a full set of mock examinations under full JCQ conditions. In terms of our next steps after the term two break, students will have a three week period of preparation with their teachers in which they'll focus on specific areas of their course content before taking the final assessments. The assessments will run from the 3rd to the 21st of May, leading to a slightly later end date for each year group than that which we recently stated to you in our last letter. These are now likely to be the 20th of May for year 11 and the 18th of May for year 13. This delay is due to exam boards releasing information regarding these processes later than they'd originally announced. Cambridge examinations will run from the 3rd of May until the 8th of June, meaning there'll be some overlap, but no clashes with our internal assessments. After the 21st of May, teachers will then be marking, grading and moderating the assessments before using the full range of our internal assessment data points to generate teacher assessed grades. We'll then submit these to the exam boards by the 18th of June. Around this time, we'll provide a transition and enrichment programme for students, which Ms Cooper and Mr Howard will explain later. Results days this year will be earlier with A-level results being released on the 10th of August and IGCSE released on the 12th of August. So to summarise, we'll be submitting teacher assessed grades based on student attainment evidence by June the 18th. To facilitate this, we'll use a wide range of internal evidence, the final piece of which will be derived from assessments conducted between the 3rd and the 21st of May using exam board materials. Results days will be on the 10th and 12th of August. I'll now pass over to Joe Marshall, our Head of Higher Education, to discuss how this process relates to university applications. Thank you very much, Mr. Potts, and good evening, everybody. Um, I think the first thing I want to talk about this evening is uh, something I get asked about quite frequently, and that's the value of A-levels where the system of assessment hasn't been as consistent. So as Mr. Potts has just pointed out, each school will have its own slightly individual way of coming towards their grades. Um, I just want to reassure everyone that universities will view all A-levels the same in terms of their grades. So a, a, an A-grade from our school will be the same as an A-grade from another school. Um, it's a very important thing to, to understand at this point, and it is something that does come up quite a lot when we discuss things. Um, I also just want to have a look at the offers coming in this year. Now, we've been really lucky. We've already had some fantastic offers um, coming in for our students, which is great um, in the UCAS system. Um, I would say this year, um, less offers are being made by universities. And, and there are a couple of key reasons for that. Um, the first reason for that is because last year there was quite a lot of grade inflation based, based on the fact that it was a slightly more predictive model which means particularly on more competitive courses, 
you have up to 20% of the students already allocated for places this year because they couldn't be fitted into the course last year. Another reason um, why there are slightly less offers this year is because again, universities are expecting slightly higher grades than they would have got a couple of years ago. And so we're making less offers accordingly. And just to give you an example of that, um, what universities would tend to do if the course say had 100 places on it, they might make 200 offers knowing that not all of those students would meet the requirements they've been asked for. Because this year, their feeling is that far more students will make those offers. They're making less offers in the first instance. So we definitely think on our competitive course, we're getting less offers. Um, we spoke to one um, representative from a, a top UK university who estimated as many as 50% less offers being made on the more competitive courses. Um, just today, I was looking at some data that suggests the GCSE profile will also be quite an important part of assessment on those more competitive courses. Um, we'd also say once the results come out, there might be a little less flexibility than in previous years. So as you may know, um, once the results uh, come out, your uh, son or daughter may be made an offer for a particular um, amount available, say three A's but they may still be accepted onto that university if they dropped a couple of grades down. Because we think there are gonna be more higher grades this year, we think there's probably gonna be slightly less flexibility at that point in the system. Uh, now, I've obviously been talking completely here about UK applications. I'm aware some of you um, are looking at international destinations, Australia, the USA, and many other places. Um, the, the impact on those places is far less, um, but if you have any concerns or you want to know more about those systems in relation to this, please do just get in contact with the HE department and we can tell you more about that. Uh, and finally, it's just another kind of reassurance really that um, the HE team will be around on the 10th of August when the grades come out and when those university offers are finally confirmed. So if there are any issues that arise on the day, um, we'll be here um, to help with those as much as we can. So to summarise, um, A-levels and, and indeed GCSEs will carry the same value for universities as they would ordinarily. Uh, the number of offers being made in the UK is likely to be reduced, uh, possibly less flexibility with grades on results day. Uh, if you need to find out more about other international systems, please talk to me and we'll be around here in the HE department to support on the 10th of August on results day. Thank you very much. I'm now going to hand over to Gavin Lazaro, who's going to talk about some of the logistical things um, to do with going forward here at the school. Gavin. Uh, many thanks, Joe. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, we want to ensure, particularly for our year 13 students, they have the best possible send off as they leave Alice Smith to commence the next stage of their journey in life, wherever in the world that may be. Uh, graduation is a key part of that and we are starting to work with year 13s to make sure that that event, whilst obviously subject to some fairly strict guidelines, is still an event to remember. Caps, gowns, hoods, a virtual formal ceremony, photographs, time with each other, time with staff on campus will all be part of that. We will even be throwing in some surprises for year 13 to help make this even more memorable for them. And of course, we want to make sure you as parents are as much a part of this as is possible, along with members of your wider family. So we will ensure that we live stream the event around the world for anyone to watch if, as appears likely, we are unable to host you personally on campus. I'll be updating you with more information as we progress into term three. But in the meantime, please pencil into your diaries the date of the afternoon of Friday, the 25th of June for graduation. The year 11 and year 13 annual awards are also a traditional part of our end of year celebrations. So please pencil into your diaries the afternoon of 10th of June. Again, the likelihood is it will be virtual. So to summarize. So for graduation, year 13s will play a major role in guiding us on this event. As ever, we're subject to SOPs and envisage, envisage this will continue to be the case moving into term three. And the date is the afternoon of Friday, the 25th of June. And then a joint annual awards event, event for years 11 and 13 will be on the afternoon 
of the 10th of June. Uh, that's all from me. I'll now pass over to David Slade, Vice Principal for Students, who will talk about the pastoral support students will receive. Over to you, David. Many thanks, Kevin. We find ourselves again facing a time of uncertainty and one where things will continue to change over the next few weeks. We understand that this can be difficult for both yourselves and students. To help, we will continue to respond to questions and changes by keeping students and yourselves informed. Student surveys have helped us actively respond to student well-being. Through the tutor program, students have engaged in supportive discussion and one-to-one -one opportunities already. Coaching and mentoring continues for identified students. As a school, we have counseled together re regarding further support structures for students, be it through pastoral intervention, home support, or through the counseling and medical services available at school. Care and consideration has been given to the timing and structure of the term three assessments to position the students in the best possible way. In summary, student support systems and services include the tutor, teacher, pastoral team and counseling services. Mentoring and coaching support continues for students and development of a bespoke one week support program focusing on transition for year 11 and 13 students separately are being planned. I pass the time now to Ms. Cooper and Mr. Howard, who will briefly outline the transition and enrichment program that we are currently shaping for students post final assessments, starting with Ms. Cooper and year 11. Thanks Dave. Good afternoon. I want to start by congratulating all our year 11 students on their commitment to learning over the last few months and their excellent attitude throughout the mock exam period. They really are a credit to the school. It might now be useful for me to give a brief overview of what students have been doing this term and what they have to look forward to. A key area of focus for year 11 in their future pathways and careers programme has been encouraging them to consider their next steps using their Cialfo platform. They've been doing psychometric assessments, which have revealed their key strengths. And they've also been looking at how they can continue to develop skills for life through extracurricular activities. We actively encourage our year 11 students to participate in ECAs, both in and out of school, as this is an important way in which they can develop skills. We'll also be running a transition and enrichment program in June, with the objective of preparing students for sixth form life. This will include a range of activities from sample A-level lessons to informative lectures, as well as skill building sessions and fun competitions and sports. There'll also be a focus on the opportunities available to students to engage in online work experience and to continue to attend university webinars and open days. Many of our students have already enjoyed these experiences, which are shared with them via their pastoral classroom. As we are unable, unfortunately, to run work experience during trip week this year, this provides a really good alternative for students looking to experience the world of work. One of the highlights of year 11 is the celebration day which we run every year to mark the achievements and attainment of our year 11 students. And more information about this will follow soon. So to summarize, students are continuing to explore next steps using their Cialfo platform. An exciting enrichment program will follow the completion of the exam board assessments internally run now and their exams. And a celebration day will take place in term three to mark the end of the IGCSE courses. That's it from me. So I'll now pass over to Andrew Howard, who is head of our sixth form. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Cooper. Good evening, all. Um, the sixth form team is also extremely excited to have the chance to work with the current year 11s in their preparation for sixth form life. Uh, with regard to year 13s, we wanna make sure that they have the opportunity to really enjoy themselves in their last term at school. We're busy working with the head students to design an enrichment week at the end of June that is a preparation for uni, life beyond school, and a celebration of their time here. 
Mr. Lazaro is also working hard with the sixth form team and head students on the graduation event. Lastly, I just wanna say how brilliant they have all been in the face of uncertainty and difficult times. They are a fabulous year group and we hope to do them proud with a great send off. To summarize, we'll be planning a fantastic enrichment week to prepare them for life at university and beyond. And we'll also be planning key events during that time in the course of the whole term to celebrate the amazing experience they've had at this school. I'd now like to hand back to Dr. Ozueki. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, parents, for your engagement. There was a lot in there, we know. And um, that was 20 minutes of us addressing all the question areas that you have raised to us through that Google form. And they really have been wide in range from the grading uh, that is now that teacher assessed grading system in place for the non-Cambridge subjects, for what the timeline will look like for those students when they return after Easter, what preparation there is for them, how any final internal assessments will work. And then for the mass, more pastoral support for the graduation that students will take part in this year and the enrichment programs that we're adding to our provision this year to support them. So we appreciate there's an awful lot there for you to digest. So we have now about half an hour to address any further questions that you might have in any of these areas. So the path forwards for year 11 and 13 after Easter. Um, and really it's, it's areas that we haven't yet addressed during the main chat or things that you're looking for some further clarity on. So in order to ask questions now, please do use that chat function. You will see there is a drop down box in there. If you can address your questions to me, Maria Oswiki, that means they will come to me and I will see them. And I will then be able to either answer or direct those questions to perhaps the person best place that we have here today to respond to them. And you can see already that we do have a wide team here tonight ready to respond to those questions. Now it's not a technical awkward pause at the moment. There are no questions in the chat. I'm sure it won't remain that way for too much longer. But if you are struggling to find at the bottom of your screen, there is a chat icon. Please do press it. The drop down box, find my name, Maria Oswiki, and they will come my way. Okay, they're coming through. Okay, Mr. Potts, one here for you on the a-level options and the choices there. So we have a question here from Anne, who is asking, is there going to be a review of A-level choices now that the mops have taken place? Where do students stand with those choices for year 12? Uh, so, well, if this is about whether students can reconsider their choices, they certainly can. And it's, it's possible for them to make changes to those uh, option choices at any point right the way up through to uh, the end of term one in year 12. In terms of a review, uh, in the sense that they can discuss those, I believe that that has been taking place and will continue to take place as part of the future pathways work that Ms. Cooper referred to. So uh, there was a lot of, uh, of information that was provided in, in academic terms in the run up to those option choices being made so that students were aware of what those courses contained. Uh, there was also work that was done within uh, the Future Pathways programme at that point, just to make sure that students were aware of where those choices and those combinations might lead to in terms of university aspirations and beyond. And that work, as I say, continues uh, from this point onwards. Thanks, Dave. I hope that answers your question, Anne. And staying with you, Dave, we have Margaret now asking a question that I think will be a question common to a lot of people listening this evening. And that is concerning the generation of those teacher assessed grades and the individual components that factor into that. And Margaret is asking here, is there any particular direction that's been given in terms of the weighting given to those different, that, those different ingredients in that basket of evidence, the MOCs, the term three assessments, coursework, et cetera? 
So in terms of any kind of numerical weighting, the only the only thing that we can be certain of is obviously the relationship between the NEA, that's the coursework component, and the exam component of any course where those two things are applicable. And obviously those will be factored in uh, when we consider the, the, the teacher assessed grade, uh, particularly as in courses where students do NEAs, they tend to uh, perform more strongly in those. And so that needs to be reflected. Um, it's probably worth noting on, on the point of NEAs that the NEAs do not need to be complete to be graded favorably to reflect the student's ability. Um, Ofqual have been quite clear about that. Um, in terms of the, the weighting in any other sense, then no, there's, there's no guidance. And I don't, I don't think that, that exam boards or Ofqual will issue any uh, hard and fast rules about the way in which different pieces of evidence will be weighted, given the fact that there'll be such variety of uh, types of evidence used by schools. So the factors that schools are asked to consider are uh, the, 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 the recent uh, nature of, of any assessment that is being used as a data point. So how far back in the course was that assessment point taken from? Its scope or its breadth in terms of the assessment objectives and the content that are covered by uh, that assessment and the conditions in which the assessment uh, was taken. So clearly, things like mock exams or the year 12 exam, they have broad content coverage. They were taken under full JCQ conditions. So in essence, they are a fairly strong uh, piece of evidence that um, we as a school are able to use, many other schools won't be able to use. But obviously these assessments that are taking place after the term two break will have uh, the value of being very recent and, and therefore having a temporal uh, relevance uh, and, and waiting if, if we want to use that word. Uh, but there are no um, numerical weightings applied in any kind of formulaic sense. Thank you, Dave. And there's, there's a few in here that I may be able to answer myself. So we've got um, Vicky asking about the EBA results. It's probably helpful here just to clarify some terminology. EBA is exam board assessments, which are essentially the same um, thing when we're talking about internal assessments. Those internal assessments that students will be taking after Easter in the non-Cambridge subject is essentially that very final assessment they're going to do with us that allows us to be able to comply with what Ofqual have asked us for and what exam boards are asking us for, which is to allow students to have the latest possible opportunity to be assessed and to show what they can do. And we are, with those uh, in final internal assessments, we are using a variety of exam board material for that. So whether they're called EBAs or internal assessments, they're the same thing. It's essentially that last a piece of work that they will be doing with their teachers in their subjects that will contribute towards that basket of evidence. So Vicky's asking, um, will the children be privy to those results or is this not permitted? Well, what is not permitted, Vicky, is that we tell students or parents what that final teacher assessed grade is, what that final holistic grade is that we will sub be submitting to the exam board for each student in each subject each non-Cambridge subject that is. We are not allowed to do that. That has been determined by Ofqual, the exam boards, by JCQ. In terms of students being able to access the, the marks and the grades for work they complete in school, well, that is entirely transparent with the students. But remember that final assessment they do with us is one of a range of assessed data that we use, but children are already aware of what those grades are. Their core assessment grades are, have been reported through the reports from the start of year 10, from the start of year 12, it's an A-level student. And um, it, 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 as long as we are able to manage the marking prior to students leaving, depending on where that, that final internal assessment is, there is no reason for us not to share that with students. What we can't do is to share that final holistic grade with you or the students prior to results days. Um, and I think that also then answers Priyasha's question. Catherine is asking a question about the timeline here. Catherine is asking, why is it that students are not able to sit these final internal assessments in June? And Catherine, that really is about the timeline that we're now being held to by the exam boards. The exam boards need those final holistic grades from us by the middle of June which means we need to build in time for the children to be able to sit their final assessments for our teachers then to go through a, a rigorous process of not only marking and moderating those internal assessments,
but then having the right conversations, putting the right platforms in to have those wider conversations and the judgments being made about the teacher assessed grade. So the timeline, Catherine, simply doesn't allow us to stretch out those internal assessments until June. They really do have to be done uh, in May. Now, remember that the students are with the teachers in their lessons for three weeks after Easter, prior to any of those internal assessments being sat with them. And we're doing everything we can to make that process uh, a very open, clear and transparent one with them. They will know for each subject when they will be sitting that assessment. They'll be doing them in their lessons, largely speaking, and they will have time with their teachers beforehand to do preparation, return to the areas of the course from which those final assessments will be drawn. Um, Stacy Lee, you've given me quite a specific one there. I will put it out there, but if, if we're not able to answer your one now, we, we will definitely get back to you. Dave, this one may be too specific um, without going back to check to, but Stacy is asking, she got an email yesterday, it had year 11 EBAs on it, but she's saying that it only had drama for year 13. Is there a reason for that? Yes, that's because GCSE drama is Cambridge, so that's assessed via the public examination route. I think what Stacey is asking is, will there be internal assessments for her other subjects, therefore, for year 13? And yes, there will be. There'll be internal assessments for every, every course that is being um, examined through the, the TAG process. Stacey Lee, if what you're asking is there is, is, is there something wrong with your schedule? Does it not show the internal ones? Then perhaps we'll get back to you separately on that. Um, Catherine, especially for those with coursework, and this is for you, Dave, if, uh, if the school now has flexibility, they, they should use that time with the students. We are doing, Catherine, ordinarily the internal coursework deadline, the NEAs, the non-examined assessments, Ordinarily, that deadline is, is before Easter, where subjects are able to, and remember, they have to factor in that marking and moderation, and in some subjects, that is a very protracted process. They are giving flexibility where they are able to do so. Dave, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, well, no, just to, just to reinforce what you've said, that, that those courses um, that are, con are conducting NEAs and still need the time to complete them, in some cases, what they've done is, is moved around where NEA um, focus has, has been placed in the course um, and so for uh, courses where the, there's still completion to be done they've extended their deadline in most cases to late April which is about as late as they can before as you say they go through a standardization and moderation process uh, to be able to submit the, those particular grades because they will also be made note to the board separately uh, because the board may still choose to moderate them. Thanks Dave. Got a couple of questions about um, what happens after students have finished their assessments, their examinations, will they be allowed onto campus, etc. Priyasha, in answer to your question about what happens after the end of the exam period and for the enrichment, well, that really does look different for every child. Remember, we still have students in year 11 and, and also in year 13 who will be sitting Cambridge exams. So that, that is going on beyond that period of internal assessment and teachers will be taking that time to go through that rigorous process. So by the time we get to June, we will be picking up a, an enrichment programme for students. Now, Jules and Andrew have talked about the heart of that programme, that, that week's transition enrichment into the sixth form, looking forward to university and beyond. There will also be some other options for students in terms of them being able to access some virtual learning uh, programmes and other things that we're potentially looking at at the moment. But in terms of them coming back onto campus physically, that is likely to be for those for that one week enrichment period and for the other events that we're scheduling there. And um, related to that, I'm being asked, can we have a timeline of what that would look like? You absolutely can. As soon as we can confirm the fine tuning of those dates for you, we will get that out to you and students as soon as possible. Dave, um, from Mina, is there a formal offer and acceptance process for sixth form? Um, and if so, when will that be? So essentially, when do people know that, they're, that they've been 
given a, uh, that they've been accepted into the sixth form program. So the uh, confirmation, the provisional confirmation of available option choices, which went out in, I think, January, um, did exactly that. It, it made a provisional uh, confirmation of those choices. Uh, and in that same letter, it also outlined what the admissions criteria were in terms of GCSE grades uh, with regard to the general admissions, but also to specific courses. Um, and so that essentially forms the offer is confirming the, the, the combination of choices and just making you aware of the, the conditions of entry. Thanks, Dave. A question here about AS levels in the future. Um, will there still be AS levels in the sixth form? And again, if, if students have already made their A-level choices, is there any flexibility about changing them? This is the, the last year that we will run AS levels um, across the British system. They are in rapid decline and are essentially losing their, their value in, in the admissions process to universities. Um, we um, adopted that, that same position probably about halfway through uh, this process of decline. We waited to see what other schools did and whether that process was to continue. We recognised that it was about two to three years ago and have slowly phased them out. So this is the last year that we will run any AS levels. Thanks, Dave. Now, do forgive me if you're putting questions in that, that we have already answered here. I will be, I will be skipping over those um, for the benefit of people that have already heard those answers several times. So do forgive me if that's the case, and please do reach out if you feel that there is a specificity about your question that we're not addressing. I have one here from Mina about the, 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 the structure and content of those internal assessments that students will be having as their final assessment after May. Um, they will be sat within lessons, Mina, so we're, we're, we're not talking about students doing exam series here. They're not doing one and a half hour papers. They were doing an assessment within the scope of a of the time of a lesson, and what we will share with students, what student, what teachers are sharing with students at the moment this week, is the areas of the course which we'll be returning to after Easter, and from which the content of those assessments will be based. What they will experience during those assessments is that the questions themselves will be what they what they would have experienced in the exam. So they are exam style questions. They're based on exam board materials, but they're not necessarily the full duration of an exam. Now, Dave, we have one here for you um, that I, I think will be a question that comes up later on as well. What can you tell us at the moment about um, an appeals process that may be in place? So the, the finer detail around the appeals process is still something that we're waiting for from uh, Ofqual and then specifically the exam boards. Um, what we understand is that there'll be two parts to the appeals process, which is firstly to um, determine whether a, a clerical error has been made in, in terms of the, the grade, the tag that was submitted by the school and the one that was subsequently certified by the exam board. Um, and then if, if the uh, appeal continues to the second stage, then that will be where the school speaks to the exam board regarding um, the extent to which we have or have not followed the process that we agreed with the exam board about generating the tag. So if for some reason we deviated from uh, that process, then perhaps that, that could be a reason why uh, an appeal is upheld. But that's really only likely if, what, if that appeal sits within a context of um, a particular subject data um, being misaligned with uh, our normal grade distribution. Thanks, Dave. Jules, I've got a question for you here um, from Margaret about the, the Cialfo. And Margaret's just wondering how much follow-up there is with students um, on the completion of the psychometric testing. And adding to that, she's, she's also mentioning that um, our, did all of the sessions, the one-to-one -one sessions per se, that were on the school calendar, were they for all year 11 students or was it just for certain year 11 students considering a certain A-level path? Hi, yeah, really good question, Margaret. Um, first of all, the second part of your question about the, uh, the kind of meetings that students would ordinarily have, they, that was basically during the lockdown period, so they never ended up happening, which was really unfortunate. 
And what we're trying to do, and I'm kind of liaising with uh, with Ruth and with Joe at the moment, is when we can fit those in at a good time for the students. We were looking at it being at the beginning of year 12, but now with the enrichment week, we're now looking at that. Can we bring those forward so that those one-to-one -one meetings can happen earlier? Ordinarily at this point, uh, I think our, this particular year 11 group have, have missed that in both lockdowns. They, were, they, they, they basically were during both of those periods of time. Um, those meetings will happen. Um, and, and I hope that that can happen, as I say, during the enrichment week. So we'll look to try and fit that in now. In the first instance, parents are also invited to, to those meetings. You also mentioned that some students have had meetings. They have, and you can at any time request one of those meetings. So while we, we do it kind of uniformly, so all students can attend, and we do that in a block of time, at any point, you are welcome to come and talk to Joe. Joe will be there waving at me now saying, yes, that's fine. And even today, I think you saw two students actually today um, with parents. So please, please, please do get in touch. And Dr. Ozawiki will show you those kind of contacts at the end for who you can contact. Um, the first part of your question was about the Cialfo platform. Um, we've had, I think now, um, six or seven um, Future Pathways lessons with our year 11 students all of which have required them to use their Cialfo platform. Um, and Shaza, who works, Ms. Shaza, who works in the sixth form area, has been ensuring that students are logging onto their Cialfo platform and completing um, those psychometric tests. They are set as assignments, um, and the students complete those assignments, and then we can check who hasn't done those. Equally, we have had a couple of workshops with parents um, to, to get parents onto the Cialfo platform, because you too can access that. If again, you have forgotten how to do that or couldn't attend one of those sessions for whatever reason, we are very happy to run a session with you to get you on the platform so you can see exactly um, what your son or daughter in your case has, has, has kind of been doing on that. Um, so please get in touch. There's lots going on. Um, I know the students have been uh, given loads of information and a lot of that goes on their pastoral classroom all sorts of links to work experience that they can be doing. There's been lots of really fantastic webinars, lots of um, open days um, at universities. And I know sometimes that students, they're so busy, they don't get onto all of those. But again, um, if you need any further information, we can support you in knowing a little bit more about what's going. We're trying to do that through the newsletter and everything else. So yes, please get in touch. Thank you. Thanks, Jules, that, that was great. Um, Harvin Deep is asking uh, Dave about study leave during the EBAs. Are we required to be at every lesson? Harvin Deep, if I may answer that one, um, yes, because when you are when you are in that period of those uh, internal assessments um, for Year Eleven, there will be a maximum of two of those per day. For Year Thirteen, there'll be a maximum of one per day. So when you are not in there, you're with your teachers still. So you're carrying on your learning. You're carrying on your preparation. Now, the, the exception to that is if you, if you have a scheduled Cambridge external exam and what we've ensured there within the internal assessment schedule is that there will not be a clash with an internal assessment and the Cambridge exam, that we will not run assessments on those days. So if you are talking about study leave for the, the Cambridge exams, if you happen to be taking one of those subjects, that for that day you come in for the exam and for the exam only. So Harvin Deep, I hope that answers your question. Priyasha, you're asking about where these final internal assessments will be located. Where they can be, they'll be in your normal classrooms with your teachers. Where that's logistically not possible, we'll be letting you know that. So please don't worry about that. You won't be fine that you're running around trying to find the location. That will all be made clear to you as we fine tune after Easter. Um, now, Joe, I think this one might be for you from Steve. Steve's asking, it, it's partly about these final internal assessments. He's asking about um, students knowing those marks, but he's asking it in the context of university offers and would it be useful for, for our son to know that final internal assessment mark if um, the, uh, the offers need to be made by early June. Now, just to clarify with those final internal assessments, remember they are precisely that, they are the final it's a piece of assessment evidence that teachers will be using in a basket of a range of internal assessment evidence. So that alone does not determine the final grade. But Joe, perhaps some words here about that relationship between the timeline, the, the grade submission, the holistic grade submission, the offers and the university acceptances. Yeah, sure. I, I, th I think obviously you would, you would start to see if you've had all of your offers back from universities, 
Um, the deadline for making those firm and insurance decisions is, is June. Um, so within that time frame, obviously, it, it's about the student and us kind of working together to see what maybe the best choices would be. Um, so whilst we're not going to have to give you the, the definite, complete final grade, obviously we can have a conversation looking at where we estimate the student roughly is. So obviously we can give some guidance in terms of where the student is in relation to their grade and in relation to their offer. Uh, and as I've said, perhaps this year we, it might be advisable to take a slightly more conservative approach um, because we think there might be slightly less flexibility in the system and really use those insurance offers as insurance offers. Um, I think if we were looking at this a couple of years ago, we, we were finding this wasn't perhaps necessary, um, but perhaps this is a bit of a return to really using the insurance offers and thinking if there is any concern about a particular grade being made, that we are careful and we do make sure that the student has a backup plan, either via the insurance offer or via another system or whatever else they're doing. So in, in relation to that, I hope that answers the question, Maria. Um, but just in terms of the, the relationship between knowing as much as we can about the grades and getting the, the university choices, there can be some guidance, but obviously we can't give 100% guarantees about what final outcomes will be. Thanks, Joe. Dave, I've had quite a few questions through that, that are repeating one that was asked earlier, but I think it's, it's worth for one final time addressing this. And the questions are relating to any specific weighting being given to the different components of assessed evidence that teachers will be using to generate that final teacher assessed grade. So can we have perhaps a final statement from you on that at this time? Uh, there are no weightings given to any of the components of the tag. The only numerical weighting that could be applied is the one that exists between the exam component and the NEA or coursework component of a course that has those. Uh, what we're asked to consider when we look at the uh, assessment evidence that we are going to use to generate the tag is factors such as the scope of each assessment in terms of how much of the course content was covered. So, for example, if you think about a mock exam that was taken in February, it covers the largest amount of content uh, that any assessment in our basket of evidence would cover. Um, if you compare that to, for example, these final assessments, the final assessments are uh, 45 minutes in length and therefore their scope is smaller, uh, but they are more recent. And another factor that we have to consider is when those assessments have taken place. There are other things that we need to consider, such as uh, what the nature of the assessment was, whether it was a part of a past paper, whether it was a centre devised task, i.e. a task that a teacher created by themselves uh, that has some reference to the uh, assessment objectives of the course. So all of those things have to be factored in, but we are asked specifically to make a holistic professional judgment. So it's not a formula. It doesn't have numerical values attached in terms of weightings, but we do need to consider those factors. What we will also have to do is make sure that we have as consistently as possible a set process for doing that across each cohort. This will have to vary given the fact that courses are composed differently. Uh, they also have slightly different progress trajectories. And so we need to consider how relevant the recency of different assessments would be given what we know about the trajectories of different courses. So there are no numerical weightings. The only one that we would consider in that sense is that which lies between the examinable content of a course and the NEA or coursework component of the course. Thanks, Dave. Um, we absolutely appreciate that this is this is kind of a difficult one to stomach. That we've been asked to provide these teacher assessed grades, and it will be a range of evidence, and that one would expect. Well, surely there's a formula here. And as Dave said, courses and subjects are so different in the way that they are structured. I reassure you that teachers know the students and are giving them the best opportunity they can to show their ability. And we have a strong body of assessment data that stretches back to the beginning of their course. And our students stepped into those mock exams this year incredibly well. So we have a strong body of data to be working from there. 
Um, a question here about how students can prepare for these final internal assessments, if they are going to be based on the type of material they would recognise um, in a, and an exam for their subjects, can they prepare by using past questions? They absolutely can, but again, they will be doing that with their teachers as well. So we've got, we've got time after Easter to make sure that they have that confidence building experience with their teachers. And yes, the format of the questions we'll be using are those that they are used to because it's how they have been trained in their courses to respond um, on the exam papers. So they will be familiar with the, the format of those questions. Joe, got a high red question for you about applying to Canadian universities. Um, is the school able to give any support with this? And how, how does Alice Smith stand in terms of reputational value with Canadian universities? Um, very, very high. Now, we've got very good relationships with all of the top Canadian universities, Toronto, UBC, um, Waterloo. We have very close relationships with that. We've had students there get their top scholarships over the last few years as well. So absolutely no problem in terms of that. I, I think the big thing actually to look out for with Canadian ones is the value they place on the end of year 12 results. So that's something that's a little bit different from, say, the UK system, whereby uh, it's more of a predicted system, and we use a series of data to create that predicted grade. And the American system, where it's an accumulation, and they put quite heavy stock on that end of year 12 exam result, which we have to kind of publish in full. We can't really move or change or, or rework in any way. Um, so that, that's quite a key thing to know if you are looking at Canada, is the year 12 is quite an important year because that, that end of year test and doing well in that is something, particularly those top universities, as I mentioned, like UBC and Toronto, take very seriously. In terms of overall support, you know, the same as always will obviously help any additional writing. Canada has moved to a slightly more holistic system in the last three or four years. So there is a little bit more writing that needs to be done. And uh, we're very good at doing that. So, yeah, if you want to find out more about what we can do or about uh, our link to Canadian universities, just let me know. Drop me an email. And we can we can arrange a meeting and talk about it more. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate that. A couple of questions about what practices we have internally when it comes to marking mock examinations, final uh, assessments. Um, Dave, perhaps you'd like to speak a little bit about our, our pre-existing and other internal moderation practices we will be using. Yes, uh, obviously, as, as you'll be aware through your own experience, we hold um, what is effectively a mock exam for every um, exam year, so year 10 right the way through to year 13. Uh, we also hold core assessments, which although they're smaller, they're held to the same rigorous standards. And that applies to the standardization of marking, the marking itself, uh, and then the moderation of those marks across a cohort. So what typically happens, particularly when um, a, a, a large exam is taking place, particularly for a, a large cohort, uh, is that teachers will, will firstly standardize their marking, uh, certainly in a, in a subject where um, there is more subjective judgment that can take place, such as in the humanities or in English, uh, where teachers will, will mark some samples, will come together to ensure that their interpretation of the mark scheme is, um, is accurate and at least agreed upon. Uh, once that's happened, the marking then takes place. There are a variety of different ways that that can then be done, where there's double marking, uh, where there's anonymous marking, where there is sample marking, uh, and teachers will mark through a series of the same question in all papers. Uh, and then after that process, there's moderation, where effectively uh, the, the, the papers or a sample of papers are put back out to different teachers to then check the accuracy of those marks. Uh, we then look to, uh, to see which are the most appropriate grade boundaries that should be applied. Uh, if it's a mock exam that's being composed of several different papers, then that needs to be a composite which reflects those. Um, or it's just a direct relationship with the grade boundaries that were applied in that exam series from which the uh, internal exam was set. So there are lots of different ways that, that normally happens. And normally subject teams will do that in a way that suits them best. Uh, in this instance, for the final internal assessments, we will have to standardise that process slightly. 
it will have to allow flexibility because the way that you would go about this process in English is very different to the way you would go about it in physics. Nevertheless, there'll have to be certain components that are similar in terms of sample sizes and so on. Um, so it's a rigorous process. Our teachers are expert at it and very used to doing it and very well practiced in it. However, it's a process that you have to learn each time that you do it, particularly if it comes to standardization and you're looking at model answers or mark schemes that relate to uh, an exam series that's new and that you haven't actually assessed before. So that's part of the internal quality assurance that we will have to make clear and transparent to the exam board. Um, and so that's a, a job for over the holidays. Thanks, Dave. And again, we have built that time into the timeline to make sure that with those final internal assessments and all the conversations that teachers will be having together and in consultation with each other and that data, we've built that time in for that to happen rigorously and carefully before we submit those final teacher assessed grades. Joe, if I may come back to you, a couple more higher ed questions, one very much in the same vein as the Canada question vis-a-vis -vis Australia. So where do we stand with Australia and, and what support can we give there? Yeah, I, funny enough, just in terms of this change in the system, the only thing that might be different this year, um, this is really only relevant if you're in year 13, and um, so you might be able to apply for the slightly early intake, which is in August or so at the end of July. Obviously, traditionally, our students can't do that um, because they wouldn't get their results until after the, the deadline had gone for that. Um, last year, we had a couple of students, particularly in Sydney, go quite early um, with reassurance and just taking those school grades because they weren't sitting additional external exams. Um, the university felt they could trust the school grades and do it on that basis. So there is a possibility if you are in year 13 looking at Australia, we obviously traditionally have advised you need to wait um, the extra six months to start in February, March, that you may be able to start earlier. That will depend on the university. Um, I spoke to Melbourne about it yesterday. They were a, a little bit more uh, less sure about being able to do that because of the state they're in, um, not the <laughs> capacity state, but more uh, the, the state they are in terms of Victoria, um, but with a slightly different system. So that's one thing for Australia. More broadly for our students applying to Australia, um, it's something you do after you've left us, but we continue to support you with. Um, so that's one of the things that's quite useful about it is you tend to know where you stand. So you tend to finish year 13, get your grades, then we can help you apply to Australia after that. Um, very last thing, I suppose, slight variation in terms of acceptances, in terms of what grades are required, depending on whether you are a home student, an Australian student, or an international student. So do look out for that and do again email me if you need any more details about this or, or want to have a meeting about any of these international destinations. Thank you. Cheers, Joe. Well, while I've got you, um, mm. is the school able to assist uh, with students who are applying for overseas universities for foundation and diploma courses? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Where, where that's applicable, I mean, that, and that's quite common. We'll certainly have a, lot, uh, you know, a good number of students applying for foundation routes. Obviously, you're talking quite a, a multifaceted thing there that there's lots of different foundations of different types in every different country so um we look at that and see exactly what it is but absolutely yeah that's that's, that's no problem at all and a relatively standard option like i said for a good number of our students thanks joe and jen that was for you i hope that answered your question there dave um in terms of the the, the shifts the tweaks that we made to those final days in school for students could you just clarify for us again what the final week of formal schooling will be for 11 and 13? So the, the final assessments will take place in the week that ends the 21st of May. Uh, at the moment, if things remain the same, which would be would be nice, but lots of things change at the moment. Uh, if things remain as they are, then the year 13s will finish on the 18th of May and the year 11s on the 20th. Thank you, Dave. And Jules, uh, one for you on uh, World of Work. I, I think you touched on this earlier, but with that not being able to take place in its normal guise in Trips Week this year, um, what, what may be available for students in terms of, of focusing on work experience? 
Yeah, you know, some students uh, wish to self-source. I've already supported somebody with that because some companies may well, um, you know, agree to somebody working with them. We've had that a couple of times, but that will be up to you to kind of source that. And I can certainly send a letter of recommendation, which I've done with, with students in the past, even if it's international. I've done that with a student who went and did a work experience in Melbourne, I think, and another who did a work experience in the, the UK. So that's absolutely fine. We can support. And if you want to self-source and can self-source, then by all means do that, you know, over the summer holidays. It's going to be more tricky for you because a lot of companies will not accept students, particularly year 11 student age. If they're in year 13, that's easier if they're over 18 in particular. But if they're not, they have a duty of care and that becomes a little bit more complex. We have, um, we have you know, uh, laws that protect companies and our students when they go on work experience that's kind of set up by the school. So we can certainly do that. In terms of what they can do in the meantime, we have Invest In, which we, um, which we have kind of um, presented on, on their, their pastoral classroom. It's a great company. They do online work experience. Last year, many of our students kind of engaged in, in, in these experiences. And so I do actively encourage you to persuade your children to look on their, their pastoral classroom. There is so much information there that um, Ruth uh, McAteer, Ms. McAteer in the sixth form, Shaza, put on pretty much every other day. There's kind of new information going on there. There's university lectures, there's webinars, um, work experience, and that will all take place continually. It's not something that just happens, you know, in, in, in kind of, um, you know, certain times. It's ongoing. Um, and there is a wealth of fantastic opportunities there. Now, we'll pick up on some of that, obviously, during Enrichment Week. Uh, but I do encourage you to, um, to have a look yourself on the pastoral classroom. Uh, but like I said, there's lots of different different ways you can go down. Email me if you want any further information about that. That's great. And Andrew, that, that was for you there. So please do reach out to Jules if you'd like to follow that up. Andrew was also inquiring there, Jules, whether or not, and Andrew, um, <laughs> our Andrew, this is one for you as well. Might there be any uh, provision here or leeway to have some form of work experience taking place in year 12 for those students um, who, who, will, who may miss out in year 11? Might there be anything there that we could do? We will be talking about that as in, you know, what that looks like next year. I think the moment next year is still unknown, isn't it? In terms of that kind of trip suite when that happens, our work experience program, we have thought about, you know, the students obviously who, who will be missing out, but let's not let them miss out. Let's let them kind of do the online at least, you know, which are very good opportunities. And then we will be obviously having a look at next year and seeing what we can do to support. I really do recommend that you, if you have people you know and you can self-source and that we can support that by kind of, you know, validating, you know, that experience, I actively encourage you to do that because certainly for some courses, and Joe might want to pick this up, you know, it's invaluable. Um, and there are certain kind of, um, you know, uh, areas where you will want your child to have done work experience. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Just obviously with medicine, where it's essential. So that, that, that is one call. Yeah. Medicine in the UK, you need to have work experience. So that's something you would have to actively seek. And if that is becoming problematic, then do obviously come and speak to us about it. Um, it is obviously useful for loads of other degrees, but that's the one where it's, you know, it's a mandatory part of the process. So. And we have a lot of good contacts, so we can certainly support you in that. It's simply that a lot of these people at the moment won't won't accept students. So there's there's not a lot we can do uh, with that situation. But certainly next year, fingers crossed, things will change. And uh, yeah, that will be much easier for us. Thanks, Jules. Thanks, Joe. And Margaret, I see there that you're asking a question about the primary campus. If I could suggest that you just email Jules about that specific question and we'll see what we can do there for you. And ladies and gents, that's that's 5.35 and we have actually come to the end of the questions that are, that are in the chat, or at least those that are not um, repeating questions that we have responded to in this section of the meeting. Um, I thank you. I thank you for your time and engagement. I thank you for everything that you're doing at home for those students. We're doing our best from this side as well to make sure they're supported. And part of that support is, is giving them what clarity we can about that pathway that is before them after Easter. Should more questions come up for you, and I'm sure they will, please continue to reach out for us. We want to encourage you to get in touch with us and ask questions so that we've got that support in place for students from home, from school, and it's working in concert together. So on the screen at the moment, you can see those email addresses for for people that have spoken today and for the people that are 
in positions that are supporting your children. So Dave Potts is anything that is exam related, results related, data related. Uh, Mr. Slade is your, your pastoral, your well-being overview of students. And then you've got Andrew Howard and Jules Cooper doing the same thing from Andrew for year 13 perspective, Jules for year 11 perspective with the added um, area there that Jules is also looking at world of work and future pathways as well. Joe is our just incredible um, leader of the higher ed team there. So please do reach out to Joe for any questions you have on universities uh, and next steps there and offers and anything to do with year 13s moving on and transitioning into, into university and what that might look like this year. And with that, I wish you all a, a good night. Um, I wish you all a, a great Easter. Um, you know, keep those kids grounded in the way that we're all trying to do. They do need to prepare over Easter for those um, for those external examinations if they've got Cambridge, but they also need that time to, to relax, to sleep, to eat well, to exercise. And after Easter for those internal assessments, they have at least three weeks with their teachers where they will be fully supported and fully prepared. Um, and we're oh, doing- really? Can I just- yes, sorry, please do Dave. Uh, just, just to come back to Stacey's question, I've just been having a look at the letter uh, to which she referred, which contains all the internal assessment dates and the exam dates. Um, and so I think what, what she's getting at is perhaps the way that the letter is first displayed uh, only shows the, the uppermost uh, date for the internal assessment for year 13. Uh, it's because the letter is sent through ISAMS, you, you only see part of it at, at for, upon first opening it. If you then go down to the bottom, open it completely in its, in, in its own window, then you should be able to see the remaining uh, internal assessment dates, which go all the way down to A-level maths and sociology. And then obviously uh, a few paragraphs from me and my sign off. So if you see that, then, then that's the letter in its entirety. But I think that might be the problem. If, if um, anybody's still having the same issue with that letter and can't see it in its, in its full glory, then let me know. Thank you. Dave, thanks for doing a very speedy bit of investigating there. Stacey Lee, if you're still out there, and you're in the chat, can you just let me know if that makes sense and that then answers your question. And Mr. Shorts, I can see you there. Would you like to say a final few words before we sign off tonight? Thanks, Dr. Maria. Look, yeah, just to um, thank those parents who have joined us tonight and students as well, um, and to thank the team, uh, you and the team that um, have presented tonight and, and helping to navigate our way through what is um, continuing to be a challenging and an ever-changing uh, situation. But uh, as you said, we're trying to give as much clarity as we can. Uh, and we're here to answer any questions that uh, students or parents may have. So please don't hesitate to, to contact us, to keep in touch with us, uh, and we'll certainly be keeping in touch with you. But um, we hope that, um, and we're confident that, that we can find our way through this as we did last year, uh, and that our students will get the results that they deserve, um, and, and we will do the very best for them. So thank you very much to you and your team, Dr. Maria. Really appreciate all the time and effort that has gone into both preparing for this Zoom, uh, but also in, in helping us to make sure that uh, we support our students as, as in the best way we can uh, before the end of this academic year. So thank you. Thank you, Roger. And thank you for all the kind messages that are coming through in the chat at the moment. Um, I will close the Zoom in that very awkward, very sudden way that we're used to now with Zoom meetings in about five seconds. So good night, everyone, and take care. <laughs>